Good afternoon and welcome to this month's show. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss best practices with machine learning and artificial intelligence strategies in the federal government. With me on today's show are Nan Malchadani, Chief Technology Officer, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, Department of Defense. Sunil Mahaduri, Acting Chief Technology Officer, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Rachel Martin, Director of Artificial Intelligence Automation and Augmentation, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Dr. Gil Alterovitz, Director of National Artificial Intelligence Institute, Department of Veterans Affairs. Henry Sowell, Chief Information Officer, Cloudera Government Solutions. Nick Saki, Principal Technology Strategist for Public Sector, Pure Storage. And John Dillon, Chief Executive Officer at Aerospike. Well, we're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about machine learning. There's billions of IT, IoT devices out there. We're hearing about Yoda bytes and Brono bytes and uh, certainly very advanced ways to transmit, store, and process data. And we've really entered into this age of performing artificial intelligence and machine learning, quite frankly, like never before. Uh, let's start with you, Nan, over at uh, the Jake, as they call it. A lot of stuff going over, on over there. We're, we're learning about Jake 2.0 and the Joint Common Foundation. Sounds like you got a lot of cool stuff going on there. Give us a top line state of the state. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, as you said, there's just an absolutely uh, a ton of stuff going on. I mean, AI is such a broad area and space that it's hard to uh, speak about it in kind of one way, right? There isn't a, it's not a single technology, it's on a single set of algorithms, it's a, uh, a wide technology space, and then the implementation space as well. So the way we're approaching the problem is uh, sort of uh, multi-dimensional. So let me sort of try to quickly take you through those. Sure. First is um, really understanding and differentiating between mature and emerging parts of AI. So when you think of data types, uh, things like uh, text or natural language processing or other sort of data types, we feel that many of the algorithms there are ready to scale. These are things that you can implement all day long, uh, you know, with great, great business return. But as you get to some of the more interesting and harder things, things like full motion video object detection and things, those are still in research land. But at the same time, we're also now applying these things to things like tactical edge and, and war fighting all the way from you know, business intelligence operations to uh, uh, warfighter health, to humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, to predictive maintenance, to war fighting. So the scope and scale of it is very hard. So what you've really got to do is take the mature parts and focus on implementing those very quickly to get the big wins. What that also does is helps you build out the infrastructure and the data pipelines that you need to enable a lot of the other cool AI stuff to happen. And one of the jokes that I always have is even though it sounds really cool to be at the DOD doing AI, most of the work that we end up doing is actually sewer and plumber work, plumbing work. So, you know, this is kind of a, a roto-rooter job, but it sounds really cool, but you have to lay those pipes and foundation before you can get to the, to the really cool piece. And the last thing I'll throw in there is around infrastructure and the Joint Common Foundation. So the other big job for the Jake is that we ourselves don't go to war. So our job is to enable every other part of the DOD to be effective. So a lot of our work that we do is building the foundational elements, like I talked about the data elements, the infrastructure elements, and the JCF is built as a way of opening up and democratizing access to compute and data for our average you know, warfighter or DOD employee to bring a AI project and we call them sort of citizen data developers or citizen data scientists to come in and do their work, which then opens up an entire, you know, set of folks who are actually working on AI as well. Yeah, you know, you've really gone from this sort of SEAL Team 6 mode of spot sort of solutions to broadening that up and out and, and making all those capabilities available, as I like to say, sort of the players and the wires part of this thing and making sure you enable the entire ecosystem there, which is fantastic to see that level of maturity happening over there at the Jake. So Neil, how about at uh, Customs and Border Protection? A lot of activity going on over there right now. I know you all are introducing uh, AI and ML in a lot of different ways. Give us a top line state of the state. Sure, absolutely. Hello, hello everybody. Um, uh, Sunil from CBP. Um, we, uh, like I think Nan was right on, as to, very similar to what Nan mentioned as to what we are doing also in that space within CBP. 
So I, I would ca classify from CBP perspective for AI machine learning into three, three or four broad areas, right? So as you know, uh, we are the largest law enforcement agency in the country. I mean, people will surprise 65,000 people keeping the country safe, there's nothing more important than that. So because of that, we are also a last, we do ingest a lot of data from not only data which we generate within, within CBP, with, uh, you know, our job is to keep the borders open and, and uh, legal, le legal, uh, uh, legal travel and legal trade. That, that, that's our main, main job. So because of that, we do generate a lot, a lot of uh, data. And we also ingest data from other agencies, uh, which, uh, which, you know, I, I can't go into that, but I'm just saying a lot of agencies also sending us data. Because of that, we do have tons of data which we can, uh, which we which we try and figure out as to what is going to happen next, right? So, so currently and even before, our main job was, hey, just make sure you're doing some transactional data. Data comes in, you're doing processing of that, and you move on. But that is changing dramatically for us too. So, AI machine learning is is uh, is one of the core competencies for us. And way we are doing that is I've divided that into like a few parts. So if you look at data in general, data, it can divide into like data engineering component, but like Nan mentioned, keeping the data ready so that somebody can consume that. There's a data science component to that, where you're looking at the scientists creating the models and, 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 you know, and the machine learning models you're building on top of that. So we have, we have component, component of that also. But the third one is, which is important, is the operational piece. And that's where we are going into, and that's where the challenges are. And we are seeing, I'll give you an example of, think about the autonomous uh, driving cars, right? So th these cars, when you're driving, it has to come to a st stop sign. When you see a stop, it's supposed to stop. So there are a bunch of cameras who, who are doing the work for that, you know, and you're collecting the data, uh, data, data together. But ultimately, the whole car has to work. The brake has to work so that you, you come to a stop, right? So that's one of the components we're looking at. Operational thing, I think, where the challenges are for us, I feel, we have also created what is the center of excellence, uh, center of innovation for, for AI and machine learning. And the reason we have done that is we did not have any standards for doing annotating data or tagging data. So we are in the process of doing that. So think about, like Luke mentioned with respect to the IoT devices, you know, we have non-intrusive inspections uh, for, from, the, from the border perspective. We collect a lot of data there, but if we, if we tag the data correctly and annotate data correctly, including, uh, you know, to, to create models on top of that becomes an important, important, uh, important for us. A lot so, of moving, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. No, exactly. A lot of moving parts. And, a lot and, of moving uh, parts going on. A lot of moving there. parts. And that's where we have challenges right now, Luke, because we are finding operational piece is the, where the difficult piece is. Collecting data, everything else is easier. We have lots of companies, a lot of different cool companies we work with who have off the shelf product which we can use. Sure. At, the end of, at the end of the day, the operational piece, the data, if, it, if you are putting in uh, the data which you're collecting is not useful anymore, you are pretty much, you know, you, you're pretty much giving wrong information to our operators. So, so Absolutely. that's why I need to make, make sure it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you collect it all and that it's uh, very accurate. A lot of moving parts over there, CBP being right smack in the middle of the economy of the uh, United States of America, quite frankly, and globally. Uh, Rachel, how about over at, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA. I know there is just an absolutely um, incredible amount of data that you all process over there and collect. And, and uh, I'm sure you're doing all kinds of stuff in the AI arena. Yes, of course. Um, and, and it's it's interesting. Um, you certainly one of our, our big challenges is that volume of data, um, not just, of course, you know, the, the GeoInt um, capabilities that the, the US government owns, but really the proliferation of commercial options in this area. Um, the work I think at an inflection point where um, we simply can't keep up with um, the amount of information that we that we are that we're receiving, um, whether it's, you know, still still imagery or or as as non referenced motion uh, video, there's just too much of it for us to be able to uh, rely on humans to to continue to process and so um, you know, investment in in AI technologies, or as we call them, at NGA AAA AI automation and augmentation, um, is really a cornerstone of of the director's uh, uh, strategy for for achieving um, what he calls our, our moonshot. 
And, um, you know, it, but I'll say it's, it's interesting, you know, you think about what NGA receives for data. And of course, we immediately go to imagery or to pixels um, as, sure. as, the, as the primary kind of data that we need to manage. But honestly, there, there's actually a huge realm of other kinds of information, um, other kinds of data, less structured data that we still also need to manage. Um, I don't think we're unique to DOD or the federal government in that respect, um, you know, beyond our um, role, you know, in terms of imagery, of course, we have other um, responsibilities that, that we have to, um, we have to meet, uh, you know, a good example is uh, aeronautical publications. We're responsible for updating something uh, around 250,000 pages of updates to aeronautical instructions every month and uh, for, for DOD and, and for other, um, you know, aviation related uh, agencies in the federal government. And that's a tremendous amount of text to go through. So, you know, I, I think uh, it's important to, to highlight that it's it's not just an imagery, it's not just a motion uh, problem set that we're dealing with, but we also have unstructured data challenges just like I think everybody else does as well. Wow, I, 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 I never knew that you all were involved with, uh, with that uh, type of aeronautical stuff. That's interesting, very fascinating. Perhaps we'll hear more about that. Gil, how about over at VA? I know there's a whole bunch of activity going on over there. I think every veteran is delighted to hear that you're using these advanced technologies to sort of further that uh, capability and deliver those services. Tell us what's happening at VA. Uh, yes, so there's a, a lot going on. And uh, I, I think when we think about some of the ways that we're going about uh, looking at that and leveraging that, um, we're creating and leveraging uh, the uh, national uh, strategy. So that's uh, involving collecting and creating different use cases. Um, there's uh, the data analytics work group of the data governance council has been uh, a way to engage and uh, work toward uh, an AI um, uh, strategy as well and to uh, gather inputs from uh, different, uh, different, uh, different, different offices and, and work together. Um, there's also uh, recently been a framework on trustworthy AI that came out um, nationally um, and that uh, across agencies and uh, mm -hmm. we're defining that uh, for what it means and, and how it can be leveraged uh, regarding uh, veterans and, and use cases there. So there are uh, kind of three areas that we're working on uh, overall uh, and across different offices that making progress in uh, that that you know I've seen in the last uh, last few months that are uh, going to enable uh, AI going forward, uh, and these include a number of different uh, ways uh, and and platforms for uh, computing, uh, which is important uh, you know for artificial intelligence, so that different different types of use cases can be uh, can be taken on um, compared to what uh, may have been possible in the past. Uh, another area is uh, developing the workforce, uh, both internally as well as recruiting from externally. Uh, that's very important uh, to uh, it, it actualizing uh, and uh, then eventually um, implementing uh, these uh, results. And of course, as was mentioned by one of the panelists, uh, data is, is quite important and information derived from that data. And so leveraging, leveraging that within the VA and, uh, and finding uh, ways of doing so that protects uh, the privacy of veterans, uh, whether it be uh, when that data and different models are uh, used uh, to around these different use cases. Uh, is important as well. Um, and then as, as we look forward, there's uh, a, a number of different uh, new approaches and research going on into how those can be used. Uh, and then in making sure that that work can go uh, very seamlessly into piloting and deploying so that those benefits can be seen uh, as soon as possible. We've stood up the AI tech sprint as one way to do that, to work with uh, industry and pr priority issues with uh, for veterans uh, and with veterans input and um, also uh, a veteran engagement board. Um, so those are some of the areas that we're starting to uh, make progress on and uh, seeing some initial uh, results as well. Fascinating, a lot of activity going on over at VA and certainly as, as we talked about, a lot of, a lot of data being created, uh, which certainly has to be transmitted, uh, certainly has to be stored, has to be processed and protected properly. And I know that uh, uh, some of our partners uh, 
are in the middle of doing that. Henry, how about over at Cloudera? I know you're 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 part of that solution to make that available for these agencies. What are you seeing across the uh, spectrum here? Yeah, everything that the panelists have said so far hits home for me, right? We're um, maniacally focused on on mission impact. And, and so when you look at the full data management lifecycle that you have to do to be able to feed a proper data science practice, it's, it's quite complex. So how do you manage scale? How do you manage uh, ingest? How do you make sure that you're prepared for data engineering? And, and like Rachel said, you have a variety of different pieces. So a lot of point solutions can address a part of that, but how do you bring it together? How do you ensure that it's governed and secured? These are all things that we're really focused on. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we've recently done here in the last uh, six months, we had a major partnership with uh, NVIDIA to bring um, GPUs and help bring uh, scale to that with our platform. And we're working with a government agency right now um, as a high priority item to take their existing uh, machine learning uh, training workloads and see what we can do. And we've already seen a three to five X improvement in performance. And, and when you really start to talk, thinking about mission, that is actually just time to value, right? Like how do we um, uh, how do we iterate quicker? Because uh, when you look at a lot of these production workloads, um, you know, very few are actually making it to production. You're talking about uh, 35% actually make it to production. So how do you shorten that cycle so that you can continue to iterate and be successful? And that's some of our biggest focus right now. Wow, it sounds like a lot of exciting things going on over there. And I'm glad to see that uh, all this contribution uh, going into enabling the, uh, the ecosystem. Nick, how about over at Pure Storage? Undoubtedly, you all must be on fire over there trying to store all this stuff properly, have uh, you know high-speed access uh, back into that capability. Tell us what's happening. What do you see from, from your vantage point? Thanks, Luke. We, we recognized several years ago that the needs for dynamic data service in an, in an AI-driven enterprise uh, were going to be radically different than what legacy technologies had you know, heretofore been able to deliver. The, the scale, the volume, the velocity, the variety of data service and data access patterns and in artificial intelligence infrastructures is, is simply radically different in terms of scale and velocity compared to you know, legacy database and virtualization workloads. So we created, along with NVIDIA, a, uh, a, an infrastructure platform called ARI, or Artificial Intelligence Ready Infrastructure, specifically suited to the types of machine learning and deep learning data access patterns. And data and AI architectures and machine learning operations is highly dynamic. A storage array isn't someplace where you, you dump data and it's never seen or heard from again. I think that if anything, the artificial intelligence era has taught us that not, you know, data is the new oil. Um, and what we've built is a refinery for actually uh, accelerating the time to value and the time to utility of that data to improve um, AI algorithm training and of course, shortening the timeline to production. So we're very pleased that uh, that, that message has, and that ability has resonated across the federal government and resulted in the adoption of, of dedicated platforms for doing this kind of work. Um, and we're seeing that, broad, that trend broadly uh, across uh, the entire industry or really the entire operational space for enterprise infrastructure. You know, in this architecture, data service has to be incredibly fast and agile, but it also has to be almost invisible. Uh, you want to get the infrastructure out of the way so data scientists can actually focus on building models, about delivering capability, about iterating the models, and, and training the AI. So you, you you need a better mousetrap to do this type of thing. Right. One more thing that we've seen, and really the last thing is, this effort has really emphasized that the need for infrastructure and data movement has to easily span on-premises infrastructure and utility computing infrastructure or cloud. So you have to build a set of, of data services within the architecture or leverage them uh, so that you can seamlessly move your, your algorithms to the workload or algorithms to the data or move the data to the algorithms. It's much more efficient to move the algorithms to the data than it is to try and, and do the reverse simply because of data gravity. So. You know, that's that's been our focus is how do we enable this and we've had a tremendously positive response uh, from a number of customers within uh, the national security space across the DoD and of course we've been very successful in biomedical research and in other areas and we're, we're just very proud uh, to have seen this coming and created the capacity for addressing this new type of workload as you should be and I tell you it's it's uh 
very important. We seem to have moved away from, uh, you know, the data scientists trying to wrestle and, and get themselves into an environment to actually perform the role of a data scientist and really just wake up and, and, and do the job, so to speak, which I think is fantastic. Definitely shows a level of maturity. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. <laughs> 